Good job, Netflix. You really managed to fuck everything up. Again. Missed the coronavirus outbreak, I started rewatching the series and I was compelled to make a breakdown in which I'll be giving the best critique I'm capable of on the new Netflix Witcher series, as it literally baffles me still how they managed to lose so much potential. The show doesn't suffer from the deviation of the source material, the idiotic and political miscasting, the lying marketing, an overall bad plot all by itself, and idiotic directing ideas like time jumps that bring nothing to the show but make it trendy like Westworld or something. It suffers from all of these things. Then again, what to expect from the company and the showrunner who have managed to single-handedly tank Marvel property in mid-2010s? Yes, I'm talking of you, Lauren. Stay the fuck away from good source material, Lauren. If you want to make your own fucking stories, make your own fucking stories, Lauren. But I digress. Believe it or not, it's oddly difficult to give a quality critique to the digestive waste of the original plot that is presented here, like a good postmodernist piece of art that it is, due to option paralysis mostly. There is such a plethora of aspects in which the new Witcher series is a horrible elimination to filmmaking. I have settled to break down the plot and direction of the series per episode, discussing it firstly on its merits as an independent product, and then comparing it to the source material and wildly digressing in long runs on the disregard and destruction of the source material, as well as the big world building problems that the show has. So of course I will start with the first episode, as it's literally mind boggling how many plot lines were ruined in this episode alone. And after I'm done proving all my points, which I will, I'll give a summary to this dumpster fire of a show. But before I go on, I acknowledge that some people genuinely like this show and I have only two recommendations to all of you guys. Firstly, I understand that considering how much shit we are fed from the screens recently, it's difficult to keep a critical think in mind and require consistent world building. I understand that weird unsubstantiated directing ideas are pretended to be smart, so popularized by Christopher Nolan, who actually knows what he's doing. He uses these ideas to benefit the story, not just cuts up the timeline and throws it into a randomizer and sees what sticks. But please, try to keep an objective mind to the inconsistencies and clear problems of a high-budget series with an amazing source material that was advertised to fill in the Game of Thrones void. Although, you know what? Considering how the show actually ended... And who has a better story... ...than Bran the Broken? Yeah, they're doing a pretty good job. Secondly, if you really like the show, read the books. Or listen to the audiobooks, you can do that for free on YouTube for crying out loud. You will not regret it. The first audiobook, The Last Wish, has similar runtime to season 1. A time miles better spent to be sure of that. So, let's dive into this mutated pile of worthless garbage. Episode 1 starts with a dim wide shot setting up a scene where the air is color graded and the backdrops are backdroppy. The camera switches to the water, to the alarmed deer, and where the fuck did they show up from? Seriously, what's up with modern movies forgetting how water works? It can be shallow or deep waters at the same spot. It cannot be both! But let me not be this critical immediately, although according to the trailer there must be better footage somewhere out there. Let's move on from here, after all it's a matter of good tone to sacrifice logic for cool jump scares, isn't it? What's the point of having 8 limbs if you're only gonna use one at a time? It's like Ikimura knows of Gero's plot armor. Although, to be completely honest, we've definitely seen worse fight scenes in good movies, so let me not hold on to this point for too long. And credit where credit is due, this is a beautiful shot. You can almost tell how much Henry Cavill actually enjoys playing the Witcher in here. What's happening to his eyes? I'm sure it will be explained later in this episode. Surely they don't leave something as important to the character on the cutting room floor. One awkwardly placed pun later. Today isn't your day, is it? Who hit short, nicely done opening credits, followed by the Witcher on his way to the nearby town, riding his horse. Alone. With no carriage. Apparently he left the Kikamura behind. Oh, he, he didn't? Soroj not only carries this 1000 pound monstrosity on his back, but also manages to conceal it and have some space left for Geralt? Did Hermione release her line of bags in this world? The Witcher walks into a tavern to ask the bartender girl for some directions. The owner of the tavern stops the girl from giving the Witcher directions, which would lead to him leaving the tavern, only so he can threaten the Witcher to leave the tavern. We don't want your kind here, Witcher. Okay, that sentence made a lot of sense. What the f- How did he even know that's a Witcher? He walked in like 5 seconds ago. How did he immediately come to know that the person who just walked in, a very dangerous looking person, mind you, is a Witcher? Furthermore, if you can tell that the dangerous looking person is a Witcher by just glancing at him, why is he threatening him? And after Geralt decides it's better to leave, this idiot tries to pick a fight with him inside of his business establishment. And what basically would be committing his suicide. Holding the Witcher in the business establishment for longer. I get that this man hates Witchers, but what the fuck? 
fuck is he trying to achieve here? Look, not even a glimpse of fear on his dumb face. And this boat midget immediately joins him. Oh, fuck off. Do these people have nothing better to do than to pick a fight with a witcher? In the books, they are being hated and despised, but they are being scared of too, you know? Lauren. Fuck me, and it's only the third minute of the episode. If these characters hate witchers oh so much, they must have heard terrible exaggerated stories of how soulless brutal witchers kill people over no reason. So why they'd ruin themselves perfectly fine afternoon by basically killing themselves is beyond me. Damn, these characters are fiercely suicidal. Whatever man, it's just the showrunner's way of letting us know the witchers are being hated upon. Why do you have to be such a nitpicker? Well, let me tell you why. It's because the trope doesn't work. This is the first interaction of Geralt with the society that we are shown, and it's not only nonsensical, but also gives us the wrong idea of what a witcher is. Once again, in the books, witchers were hated by many, just as well as anything that's unknown, deadly, and wants your money for help. But walking into a tavern wasn't quite like a black dude walking into a bar during the Jim Crow era for crying out loud. And the way the show portrays it, it's more like a Jew walking into a Nazi bar. Although, if they were to try anything, it would look like a very specific Jew walking to a very specific Nazi bar. Three minutes into the episode and I'm already thinking of better movies. Needless to say, in the books, the scene never happened the way it's portrayed here. It happened much later in the Lesser Evil story. When Geralt purposely goes to meet Renfri and her gang, bored and drunk, confident in their numbers and skills, try to pick a fist fight with a Witcher. There was no great hatred of the Witchers, just curiosity and insults to stir the fight. Something that anyone who had ever had a fight picked with will recognize. And the tavern owner was too scared of the gang to open his mouth. But I guess we cannot expect Lauren to know how a bar fight feels, can we? And I want to stress that Geralt came to them to meet their leader. They weren't just desperate to threaten a witcher his life. That would be stupid. Character. Motivations. Lauren. Never mind that the scene lost all of its humor. This scene is also inspired by another book scene from a different short story, the opening scene of the Witcher story, the story about the Striga. This wonderful princess. The Witcher story is the first story told in the books, and the scene in question is the opening scene of the story. In other words, it also had a job of introducing the character. Generally, starting with the lesser evil story is very strange. The whole idea of introducing the Geralt with a moral dilemma before we get to know him is odd narration. Any story first needs to establish the character's basics and then expose them to difficult situations, revealing more traits and forcing them to growth. So, why, Lauren? You have a favorite one. The lesser evil. That's one of my favorites, too. <sighs> In the Witcher story, Geralt purposely goes into a shady tavern in Vizima to pick a fight so he can promote his skills. Two drunks in the tavern decide to pick a fight with him because he's Rivian according to his accent, not knowing he's a Witcher and apparently not expecting him to slice them open immediately, which he did in two blows. On one hand, this is a Han shot first kind of a scene. It introduces the character as a cold-blooded badass. On the other, Sapkowski, the author of the book, shows us that there's plenty of ignorance and shadowism of all sorts in this world. And by the way, he's not actually Rivian as it comes out later, he only fakes the accent. Back to the show. Renfri? Nope. This chick is not Renfri. Renfri was raped and thrown around the lowest lows of the society from a very young age, forced into a survival mode for many years only to join a gang of mercenaries and turn the tide back, becoming a leader of the gang in pursuit of her revenge. Does it remind you of any other character in modern fantasy? Now imagine Arya Stark looking this feminine and innocent. This girl is not Renfri, she's a young Karen at best. I am speaking to you now, good sir. She's anything but intimidating. And this man hates money. Well, Karen commands to what we find out are her men to take a chill pill because she's not suicidal. Yet. Bitches can't be trusted. I'm not speaking to you. Of course, credit where credit is due. The actress is very charming and plays what she's told to pretty damn well. But why is she so caring towards Geralt? Oh, instant Borna Force is gender neutral now. I see. I mean, that kinda makes sense. Henry Kell is one handsome man after all. Cavill could destroy my body and my life, and all I'd say is, so does tomorrow work for you too. But why is she made to be this sweet? This girl. Fuck this girl. She talks so much about herself that I don't need to. She said she's the older man's daughter, that's all we need to know about her. They walk out to Roach, where she tells Geralt there was no contract for Kikimura since they are useful. Population control. Fucking what? This is not New Jersey, you idiots. This is Middle Ages. There can't be too much game for hunters. People are still actively starving all the time. If there is population control need be done, trust me, there would be enough people controlling it. 
See, this is what I mean when I say writers want to seem smart. In The Blood of Elves, the book they will gut in season 2 apparently, Vesemir even specifically teaches Ciri that these beasts are outside of the local ecosystem and they are parasites brought by the conjunction of spheres. The only people concerned with the extension of these species are clueless scientists of this world and sorcerers for the magical properties of these creatures. But who cares for proper world building? We Googled a smart word today, I mean we need to include it. Furthermore, so Geralt read a poster on a contract for Gavir. He posted a flyer. For Gavir. Can he not tell the difference between Kikimura and a Gavir? Can he not read? Why is he still talking to this little twat? Just tell her to call the older man. You don't know who this little crazy child is. This makes no fucking sense. And now she takes him to the sorcerer and Geralt still didn't meet the older man. You should speak to Master Irion, our wizard. He's willing to pay for odds and ends he needs for Alexis. I sold him our dog when it died. Mysteriously. Little cunt. How many times do I have to tell her? Don't train alone. It only embeds your errors. Lauren. I also wanted to point out this part. He degenerate born of hell. Have you ever been to hell? Hell is a concept tied to Abrahamic religions, therefore any high fantasy avoids using words like hell or any other words tied to real world traditions since using these words will give a new viewer a wrong idea of where the setting is while breaking suspense of disbelief for a person familiar with the world. And I know that many will say my complaints so far mostly have been nitpicks. Well the thing is, all I've pointed out so far are logical holes in dialogue, behavior and logistics. All these holes make the narrative incoherent. All these things let us know that it's not the character saying these lines, it's the actor reading the script. And there can be no stakes, no tension, no empathy to the characters since we are constantly reminded that any action is arbitrary. All reactions and all consequences will be whatever the author decides and the characters are just dialogue devices at best with not even the simplest rules of reason considered. In the books, there was no contract, and Geralt now went to a tavern to find the Alderman. He knew Cadman, the Alderman of Bracken, pretty well. He killed the Kikimura on the road, knowing it must have been dangerous, especially for children playing, and also hoping there might be a reward for it. And since Kikimuras don't pose as much of a challenge to the Witcher, it was worth taking a risk. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Geralt is broke, and he's trying to make it past the mountains before the snow sets in. The Alderman invites Gero to stay at his place for the winter, but regarding Kikimura, they have no allowances in the budget for him. The Alderman proposes to see the new sorcerer of the town, Master Illyrio, maybe he'd have some use for the Kikimura's body. When they go to the tower, the sorcerer lets Geralt in, and to Geralt's surprise, Master Illyrio happened to be Stregobor, a sorcerer Geralt met during his old contract with Kavir's court as the court mage. The meeting had humanity, levity, jokes, what do we get instead? A clear villain of the story, if anybody's guess why, Stregobor was another man of the world, a far from perfect man that had a good share of mistakes behind him and probably no less in front. He was scared and all but begged Geralt for help. But no, we get a little mustache twirling evil guy. At least they got the illusions right. Oh look, they give the bad guy an apple. Subtle. And this is why we had Renfri and the Suicide Squad in the opening scene. This is why Renfri was shown so caring. Because Lauren decided we should favor the caring and reasonable Tumblr girl Renfri to evil Stregobor. I'll leave it up to you to decide what the motives were behind this. I'm not going political yet. Not just yet soon. They discuss how witchers don't have feelings, a common false rumor about witchers that Geralt preferred to stay alive as it made his professional life easier. A sorcerer like Stregoborn must have known better, but then again, this is not the book, so let's just accept that as a given. Speaking of, did we discuss anything about what a witcher is so far? What do we know of the witchers from the show? They fight monsters, apparently, and they have no feelings. What makes them good at fighting monsters? Are they good at fighting monsters? Why do people hate them? Is there a merit to that? What the flying fuck is up with his eyes in this scene? Questions this episode does not answer at all. And this whole dialogue is just so dry and forced down our throats. Fuck this nonsense. We are moved to Sintra and we see a girl who, as we find out later, is a princess playing with some kids outside of the castle walls. Alone. For a loaf of bread. Pretending to be a commoner. How the fuck did the lioness of Sintra, the great and powerful Kalanta, let her only granddaughter wander around streets with no security as a commoner? Needless to say, this is stupid on so many levels. 
Not only is this a very class-based, segregated medieval society where such behavior would cause prestige to the court, especially in the eyes of the people who gave their allegiance to it. Not only is it dangerous for cute young girls on medieval streets, not only ransoms were a thing back then too, you know, not only did Calante as any ruler had political opponents outside as well as within her kingdom and disappearance of the sole heir or imprisonment and possible political re-education slash forced marriage to get Sintra in a dynastical struggle would be a great prospect for many, many powerful people. But she could, but she could just been killed by a simple accident. This is just so stupid. And the show proves us these kids hate her later on, which I cannot blame them in honestly. This rich twat is literally trying to win their brat, and she really seems to be dedicated to do so. And the show can't claim that she ran away or anything according to the reaction and the ease with which the guards find her. And I can't get over this, why is this rich girl playing for brat with commoners? Not what you'd call a character to root for, now is she? Oh my god, this would fucking take forever. Okay, let me go through some of this stuff quick. Freya Allen actually looks pretty good as Siri. She looks young and not yet as pretty as she will become, like many teenage girls usually do. Very accurate to the way she's described in the books. And she has this otherworldliness to her looks, something that Siri should have since her features are very much of elven nature. This reminds me of elves. I understand they had to age her, but those lenses are horribly obvious. Her hair color by the books also should be gray, like that of Danny from Game of Thrones. Kalanta and Siri are supposed to look alike, but they don't because, as the producer said in their interview, the difference in the looks between them is to show the lack of powers in Kalante. It's okay, I'll roll with that, it's not a bad idea. But this is not a great viking warrior, and this is not a powerful queen. This is a disrespectful loudmouth tomboy at best. But we'll keep these characters for the nearest future. They will soon will find out the surprise, an expanding empire hell-bent on conquering the world that borders with Sintra attacked. How unlikely. Back to our super witcher and Twirly Stash. Twirly Stash tells the story of children born during the Black Sun, an eclipse. How they were supposed to be sent by Lilith, or cursed by Lilith, something to do with Lilith. Basically, they are mutated, they are evil, and magic doesn't work against them. And so they were put into towers and or killed. In the books, the big reason why some of these girls were killed is because the stupid knights would try to save the girls from the towers they were imprisoned in. Making fun of fairy tale tropes, of course, but whatever. Renfrey is one of these children of the Black Sun, which, if you think about it, sounds like a punk band. She's trying to kill Twirly Stash in revenge. Twirly Stash tries to convince Geralt to kill the punk, claiming it would be the lesser evil, but Geralt tells him all rock music is evil, prog or punk, and that he's more of a hip hop guy. It's the motherfucking DLWG. By the way, at this point, there were three unfunny jokes about Geralt needing new clothes. And you desperately need money for new clothes. That's enough to buy some new clothes. Where did you learn your trade, you stupid fucking cunt, you idiot? The authors realize the clothes have to look bad for this to make any sense. I mean, his armor looks like a cheap BDSM corset, no doubt, but it's not ripped or cut. As a matter of fact, the biggest problem with Super Witcher's looks is he's just too bloody fucking handsome. Legit. He can Superman this hoe. At least add some scars and give him actually bad clothes. The man is basically a hundred year old bomb on drugs. Back to Sentra, and this is the last time jump I'm gonna be doing. It makes no sense for this review to be just as disjointed as the show itself. We are witnessing a ball, and it looks mostly nice. Mousek doesn't look anything like a druid is described, but it's fine. Not like we need world building or anything. Both guardian force cross the armor pass. Get it to Sodden if they're smart. Why is Kalante acting so hard? I haven't seen people overly act like this in a high school theater for crying out loud. Never mind that if you look at the map, you'll know that there is no way to Sodden without taking Sentra first. You idiot! You won your first battle in Hotchbuzz when you were my age. 3,000 of my men died. Keep this in mind, it will come up later. Diversity hire! No, 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 it's not the time yet. We'll speak of diversity hires later. I fucking promise. Okay, guys, this is part two. I've got myself a new microphone that's somewhat better, and I'll try to keep myself from spreading away in my rants. Thank you very much for all the kind words and support. It's really surprisingly touching. With that said, let's jump back into this mess. So yeah, as I've mentioned before, Diversity Hire surprises absolutely nobody with the fact that Nilfgaard attacked. This is number one bullshit. Now I promise no more time jumps, but we gotta do one last time jump, and just guys, please stick with me. So, Geralt camps outside of town. Okay, instead of finding a tavern or anything, or whatever, who needs comfort in their life? Never mind the dangers of sleeping outside, especially with no tent. You can tell someone never been camping, huh? Ramfrey shows up to talk shop with Geralt. Geralt confronts her, telling her he knows who she is. 
You know that I want to kill Stragobor then. I used to be a princess. Can you tell you that? Until he sent a thug into the woods to kill me. You killed him. With my mother's approach. Have you seen anyone so impressed with themselves? She tells a story of how she was raped and robbed, etc. The way she speaks meant to draw sympathy and nothing else. We don't feel aggression, we don't feel character. This is not a woman who fuels herself with anger with what has been done to her. This is not a strong independent person scarred with tough past. This is a girl asking for sympathy favors, specifically for Geralt to kill Stragobor. She's also shown redeemable, which is a serious deviation from the source material. Oh, and remember how I said to keep this in mind? Your first battle in Hotchbuzz when you were my age. It's because of this. Queen Calanthe of Sintra. She just won her first battle at Hotchbuzz. Yes, we have two different timelines. The show jumps in time spans of over half a century within a season. Several times within a season. And I, as a big fan of the books, could not follow when and what is going on. No thanks to their clues. And I know when all this was supposed to take place. Instead of using the narration the way it was in the first book, The Last Wish, with Geralt remembering the stories from the Temple of Malakali, where he was healing his wounds after fighting the Strigger in the first story, The Witcher, instead of the linear story of the second book, The Sword of Destiny, which the show probably butchered even harder than the first, we get this trendy attempt at being like Westworld. Why? What have these time jumps given us but allow Lauren to tell stories that shouldn't be told together within the same episode? <sighs> Back to the plot, Renfri and Geralt have a philosophical discussion about does killing the people who think you're a monster prove that you are a monster or not? What if they come after you? Attack you? They have. Why not kill them? Because then... I am what they say I am. This is number one bullshit. It really is some try hard to sound smart nonsense, yet Renfrey keeps being presented as the sympathetic grown girl who can't forgive as if the matter at hand is teenage breakup. Geralt refuses to kill Stragobor and leaves her wondering if she's a monster. One thing Geralt is not is a simp, am I right? Thanks. Back to Sintra. No, no, fuck off, no more time jumps. We're shown Geralt telling Roach about his first encounter with a monster. Wanna hear about my first monster? He was huge. Stinking. Bald head. He pulled that girl from the cart. Tore her dress off in front of her father and said, It's time you met a real man. And honestly, this is the only part from the books in this episode that's adopted decently. Not well. Decently. Then referee creeps up on Geralt from like 15 yards away and insults Geralt's perceptions. Decent doesn't last here, guys. Tell me which, uh... Do you bleed? Oh, sorry, wrong movie. We establish through dialogue that Geralt doesn't believe in anything, doesn't take sides, he just kills monsters. Renfri says that Geralt gave her ultimatum. You gave me an ultimatum and I find they were. Although he never did. You choose, princess. He never gave you an ultimatum, you dumb dumb. Tomorrow I'll leave Bavakin. After which Renfri proceeds to sexually harass Geralt, and we're presented with some ridiculous prophecy slash LSD slash sex scene. You're in the market. Covered in blood. You say you can't choose, but you had to. And you'll never know if you were right. You will try to outrun the girl in the woods, but you cannot. It really is difficult to manage a sex scene with these two people look confusing and not sexy. But the showrunners are talented like that. The next morning, Geralt wakes up just on the ground without enough fucking blanket on like, and realizes Renfri is not going to leave and that she will present an ultimatum to Stragobor. That is what she meant when she said ultimatums work. Although, it obviously did not work on her. Or maybe it's because there was no ultimatum. What is logic at this point? So by coming back, Renfrey involved the Witcher, who wanted nothing to do with this fight, in the debacle. Lauren, all you had to do is read the book and copy. The short stories are short, the narration is very reliant on visuals and dialogue. It's not filled up and down with inner dialogue and clues that would be a giveaway if they were put on screen. Why did you do this incompetent fanfic take? Lauren? And yeah, I put full responsibility of what has come of the show on Lauren, since she seemed to have had all the creative freedom one can dream of. A person who self-admittedly read the books only after being tasked with the project. Netflix, what the fuck? In the books, Geralt and the Ottoman went to meet Renfri after talking to Stragobor, since he knew people will be killed if she seeks her revenge. 
The fact that Geralt is not impervious to innocents dying was set up by him killing the Kikimaru partially to protect local kids when he had no necessity or obligations to do so. Here, before Carol talks to her, he meets her gang. A bunch of mercenaries drinking, bored and cocky, looking for a fun fight. Only one of them, a half-elf, was picking on Geralt because he was a witcher. And they only found out he's a witcher because one of them saw him stroll into the town with Kikimura. They didn't just smell him to be a witcher. Others were wanting to just pick a bar fight. And as I've mentioned before, anyone who has ever been in a bar fight will recognize this immediately. It also showed some sort of a chauvinism typical of people who feel unjustly targeted like a half-elf in Sapkowski's world likely does. Subtle yet telling. But Lauren believes in blunter methods. Elven mages taught the first humans how to turn chaos into magic. And then the humans slaughtered them. <sighs> Even in fantasy, everything has to be followed with the straight white males beyond the complex racial relationships that Sapkowski wrote in the books. Lauren, you're, you're something. She also has no idea what a bar fight feels like, so instead we got this example of logic harassment. Go. On your own, or at the end of a rope. Your choice. Not a hard choice. Yeah, fuck that. Kill him with your bare hands if you have to. Renfrey shows up and cuts her man off in a much more, shall I say, convincing way than Karen. Shut up, Sivril, immediately. Sivril stopped laughing. Immediately. Geralt wasn't surprised. There was something very strange in Renfrey's voice, something associated with the red reflection of fire on blades, the wailing of people being murdered, the whinnying of horses and the smell of blood. Can you not leave it alone for a moment? Oh, that was scary. Yeah. When Geralt and the Alderman talk to Renfrey, she reveals she has a king's order, rendering Alderman and all his threats of justice obsolete. In the meantime, the town is preparing for a fair, scheduled for the next day, in the background. Later, Renfrey sneaks into Geralt's room at Alderman's place because sleeping in a tent sucks! And it sucks even worse without a tent! She tells him her story, how her stepmother wanted to get rid of her for dynastical reasons and used the curse as an excuse. How she had to fight through her life, how she was raped by the people who were helping her, how she was robbed of everything, even her hair. How she then got away with seven dwarves from Mahakam that helped her. Yes, Renfri is actually Snow White. You wouldn't get that from the show now, would you? She even speaks of the great evil, the one that will force anyone to choose the lesser evil, countering Geralt's refusal to choose between evils. She also mentions something called a Tridem Ultimatum. Geralt warns her he and the Alderman will fight her if she dares to attack the tower, and she will die. This was an ultimatum. He convinces her to leave next morning. After which, the tomboyish but very attractive princess sleeps with Geralt. Not this ad alone of femininity, mind you. Not out of feelings, but because she's used to getting what she wants. No prophecies, no LSD trips, just sex. Next day, he mentions this dialogue to the Alderman. In response, the Alderman admits that he would not dare to stand against Renfri since not only that King's Order could possibly cost him his head, but also because of her gang. He lists some of the atrocities attributed to these mercenaries, including forcing a governor of a town called Tridem into submitting to their request by slaughtering hostages on a ferry. This is where it hits Geralt as to what Renfri's plan really is, to slaughter people during the fair until Stregobor leaves his tower. It also should be mentioned that Marilka was much younger in the books and her only purpose in the plot was to repeatedly ask her dad to go to the fair during the scene. He comes to the market where her men stand, and the rest is similar to how it went down in the show. Discount Marilka and the horrible fight with Renfri. But the context is completely lost. Before his fight with Renfri, she tells him that Sregobor laughed at her threats and replied that she could kill as many as she wants, but he would never leave the tower. Renfri gave up on her idea. Geralt realizes he killed her men to no result. He did choose what he believed was the lesser evil, when evil would have been avoided had he not chosen at all. And this will be a lesson for him for many years to come, a principle he will have to confront many books later in Time of Contempt. But back to the fight, uh, seriously, he shook off this step. Look at the blank of the blade! In the books, Geralt gets cut by Renfri and immediately after stops being defensive and slices Renfri open from bottom up. Also in the books, she was wearing mail, but hey, played as useless in the show, I can't even imagine what a nuisance mail would be. 
Bleeding out, dying, Renfrey begs him to hug her, but Carol doesn't budge. As she dies, a dagger is released from her hand, showing how full of anger the young princess really was. It makes us ask the question, was it the curse of her life that made her irredeemable even in the face of death? A point completely missed by the show. Similarly to the way it is in the show, Geralt didn't let Sregobor do an autopsy on the princess. To his own surprise, he understood deeply what has shaped this poor girl into what she has become. The book Stregobor suggested to Geralt to immediately leave town with him, predicting that the town folk will see these murders as butchering, not knowing Geralt was only trying to save their lives. The town folk starts throwing the stones, but Alderman commands them to order and tells Geralt to leave the town of Plavikin and to never come back. There, plot killed, point lost, and a silly, unrelated prophecy adopted. The cow in the woods will be with you always. She is your destiny. But, instead of it being in the Blaviken forest where Geralt meets Ciri for the first time some 20 years from this moment according to the show, they meet in just some forest for no reason, making the prophecy absolutely stupid. But I'll get to that in due time. In summary, I'd like to also say that Henry Cavill seems to be a great guy. Henry Cavill seems to have a ton of fun in the show. Henry Cavill is not acting in this show. Henry Cavill is there to look cool, not to act. There is no emotion, there is no depth. In every shot, you can feel that the scene is concerned with the looks of Geralt and not the emotions. Some evidence for that would be that he makes so great stills and reaction shots. And that's not Henry's fault, I'm sure. As a matter of fact, I don't think any of the actors on the show to be incompetent at their job. It's because of the task at hand and the fact that Henry doesn't have a character to play. All of the character revealing and building moments were either caught, altered, or just completely missed the point. So he's more of a male model here than an actor, like in one of those perfume commercials, and I swear some of them have more material to work with. I will speak more about this in subsequent reviews. One more thing I'd like to note about Renfrey, she was portrayed by this beautiful piece of ass, Emma Appleton. This is not a sexist thing. But originally, Miley Brady was cast for her role. Book Renfrey is tall as Geralt, blonde with short hair. Hair that never grew the same ever since it was caught when she was on the run. A very personal thing for any lady in one hand, and a very allegorical statement in the other. Now I understand that Emma makes sense as she fits the role Lauren written for her, bad as it may be, and the visual changes between Karen and Renfrey are the smallest changes made to the character. But, and this is pure speculation, look at these two young ladies. I think Lauren made Renfrey into an absolute self-insert character for herself. And with this speculation in mind, I think all the torture the source material was subjugated to here starts to make more sense. You have a favorite one? That's one of my favorites too. Since I've skipped the rest of the central timeline, cause unlike the show I could not be bothered to follow the Three-Eyed Raven on LSD school of editing, let's go back. The Queen and the King have gathered forces on a battlefield. How is that a battlefield is anyone's guess. How do these experienced warriors know exactly where the battlefield is? Apparently by their reaction they didn't even know what size of a force they will be facing. Did they have no intelligence yet they knew where to come to battle to? Did Nilfgaard answer their RSVP? The movie makers expect us to operate with movie logic and just accept that there has to be a major open fronted battle with no strategic or tactical thinking applied. But let me break it down. I do love myself some medieval history, as well as history of engineering of weaponry, so I do know what I'm talking about as long as I'm not talking too much on the topic. Plus, you know, I watch Shad's videos. Yeah, that helps. Open battles are a rarity in medieval warfare, and they always happen exclusively with two forces being equal in number. And even so, there is always strategic maneuvering that puts the battle inevitable. Usually bigger forces always will try to outmaneuver smaller forces or bait them into a trap, while tactically speaking small units of heavy cavalry or light cavalry in case of Mongols would always try to hit in the flank and leave creating disarray, damaging or cutting off supplies, slowing down forces, leaving casualties and fleeing before the enemy can regroup. Never would a force like this, knowing how undermanned they are, stand and take a direct blow. Never would a cavalry be outflanked and open field by infantry. Never would it accept a battle it cannot win, unless covering a retreat, but they have no one to cover. So let us consider that Calante had no idea of the size of the invading force, which means there was no intelligence, which is not only improbable, but also then proves that they could not know where the battle would take place. I always forget we live in a time where people cannot tell up. You are a cavalry, you idiots. Why are you standing and waiting for an overwhelming force of foot soldiers to overtake you? At least flank them! Medieval cavalry had only two modes on the battlefield. Terrifying attack and terrified fleeing. 
Flank Nilf Guardians. Oh my god, who approved this bullsack armor? What the fuck is this? Made of an actual bullsack of a fucking dragon or something? What the fuck is happening? Netflix, did you really pay tens of millions of dollars for this? Why are you standing, you morons? Flee, move, flank them a couple of times. They can't do anything against you. You have knights trained from early age, covered in metal on horseback. Oh, never mind, this Hollywood armor is absolutely useless. I could never understand how come wooden shoes work, but steel plates don't. Strange. Oh, I remember this part? 3,000 of my men died. She has less than 3,000 men here at this battle. Now these could be immediate forces they could gather, consisting of her personal guard and a few city knights she could master, which is contradicted by her statement of preparedness. Fifty of your skeleton ships are on the way. We have more knights. We are prepared. But even then, why not stay and defend the fortified city instead? Or this is more or less all Sintra can master, in which case losing 3,000 men and calling it a victory is ridiculous. Medieval warfare had almost never been fought till last man standing. It was always a fight to retreat and most casualties were inflicted during a panic and retreat and still they hardly ever amounted up to 20% of the losing side. This is utter nonsense and the source material warns of it. It's not like they had no way of knowing better, the books you base this on knew better. Cavalry has no order in attack, but no guardians. Why is everyone running? Try running a full sprint for 100 meters with 20 kilograms of armor up and down a hill with a sword in your hand and then swing the bloody thing a couple of times. I dare anyone in the production team to try that. I'm so out of shape. If you take a hyper detailed and relatively realistic source material, can you not shit all over it? At this point, they could have called it whatever they wanted and released it independently cause this show has as much to do with the Witcher lore in the books as upper mention Snow White. Oh look, a helmet fell off somehow. On the best armor the money can buy. Yeah, we can tell. You pulled your man in the middle of a overwhelming infantry, you dumbass. Way to keep your man from panicking, though. This is number one bullshit. Did you send them an RSVP too? You're in the middle of a battle and I don't see a sea around. And who the fuck told you about the storm in the middle of the battle? Or did you just keep this information to yourself? Yeah, you should have thought of that when you led your cavalry into a hand-to-hand -hand with a running infantry made of marathoners, apparently, instead of land strikes and retrieving, or better, defending the castle slash city. That's why you and your ancestors paid untold amounts of gold to build them, you fucking twat. It's not just a trendy house design, you know? And a clear evil rider in the background. <laughs> oh my god, she took off her helmet immediately after this moron got shot in his eye. You know what? I'm giving up on this battle. And apparently so did the writers. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you acting. Lauren. Meantime, back in Sintra. And for the love of god, I still can't get over the editing. I don't know why they couldn't at least make this plotline linear. We will be coming back to here till the end of the season. And the really messed up thing is, Geralt and Ciri haven't met yet. And we know Ciri survived the slaughter of Sintra. Way to spoil yourself, you incompetent idiots. Lauren, have you actually read the books? Oh, I'm sorry, telling you to read the source material written by a white male is probably sexist in some way, right? Yes. So first we have Mossack randomly telling Siri the story about the punk band girls. I wonder why is he telling her that right now? Then, soon enough, the lioness of Sintra comes back injured after a devastating defeat with a loud mouth of a sore loser. What follows is a pretty nice scene some actually decent acting here between Calante and Siri. You can almost forget how a city like Sintra is being taken with what seems to be like minutes. Next, we have Mossack creating spells. How long will it hold? As long as I hold. Yeah, sure, it folds the same night, absolutely unclear how, since he still holds. Why can't you just cast the spell again? In the books, there were spells cast on the castle years ago. It took three days to take the keep with the use of magic. This is pathetic. Presence of Mausek is also insulting during the siege. The man can teleport! This is number one bullshit. You show that he can teleport. He did teleport with Geralt days before. According to your stupid plot. All of this nonsense could have been avoided if one of you idiots would remember that, huh? 
You know what? I'm going to call him Balsack from now on. So Balsack tells Catwoman that Destiny might still side with them. Words absolutely empty because of the backwards storytelling, by the way. This means nothing right now. There are no talks of Destiny yet. We don't know that Siri is a child surprise destined to Geralt. We just need to keep this in mind and feel the payoff when they show us the scene again in the final episode of the season. In the books, Nilfgaard was never this evil empire per se. It was no worse or better than the rest of the states. It was just much, much more powerful. Somewhat like the Ottoman Empire of the 16th century, for instance, or the Roman Empire in the ancient times. The slaughter of Sintra was the first time something horrible like that has happened. It's not the fanatical craziness that was scary. It was the organization and the expansive aggression that was terrifying about Nilfgaard. While everyone was playing a dynasty game in the north, the south was combined by force and order. It is a somewhat tyrannical order, definitely, a much more centralized power, but these are not jihadis on a task to convert or slaughter everyone. Three, two, one! <laughs> Some show of serious powers and we're on the way. I, I, I can't get over that. Teleport, you fucking buffoon! The diversity hire suicides the guests of the palace. Bolsek and Ken show Siri a way out, while Kalante cosplays Tom and Baratheon. Although technically this part is true to the books, so Tom and cosplays Kalante rather. <laughs> Both sex Siri and Ken leave from some sort of a doorless door frame. Is that door on the side of the castle? Does the tunnel lead to this door from the castle? Why didn't everyone try to escape from this door? You know what? Fuck that! Why did this idiot not open a teleport? And now someone screams from the god knows where in a burning city mid slaughter. Hey! Keep going. Balsack decides to create a diversion. A powerful sorcerer goes on to be captured by some random new guardian. Send fucking Ken! He's useless! He's definitely fucking useless! Do you think this tool in knightly armor will be able to protect the princess? Speaking of, you're running away into refuge. Did anyone bother to get some food? Supplies? What, what's going on? Why did Kalanta not send diversity hire and every other fighting age man with Suri? The book Kalanta did exactly that! Siri asking some basic bitch questions. My grandmother said I had to leave. Why? Why is Nav got here? Seriously, this just just hurts to listen. You're in the middle of a fucking battle. And why is it so quiet in the burning sieged city? Oh no 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 this is not Gahir. No, this is not the terrifying black knight with the black bird on his helmet. This is a fucking chicken. He looks like a fucking chicken. You gotta admit he looks like a fucking chicken. For your information, Mr. Marksman here is an Elvgardian knight that was the last thing Sira remembered during the siege. For years she won't be able to forget him. She will wake up screaming in the middle of the night after she dreams of fire, blood, and amongst it all the rider in the black steel with a bird on his hat. The helmet wasn't for lacrosse. His face was shot behind it. Oh, and good job at spoiling yourself again! Oh, thank you, you idiot! Geralt was not in Sintra during the siege. Geralt was on his way to Sintra to get Ciri away from the war after he refused to take her away twice. Once when he came to see her six years after her birth, Kalante challenged Geralt to choose her out of the bunch of random kids. To which Geralt refused altogether saying he didn't want to take the child only to look in the eyes of destiny. And once when he absolutely accidentally met her in the Broccolon forest not even knowing it was her. Geralt and Ciri became very close in that trip before Geralt realized who she was proving him that destiny has grasped him. These important character developing scenes are not present in this wonderful dumpster fire. Good fucking job, Lauren. The entire point of the second half of the second book, The Sword of Destiny, the one that was butchered by Lauren the most, is that Geralt was sure that Ciri had died in the fire. And Geralt knew the little girl. He actually learned to care for her. It wasn't just a plot point, and after the battle of Sodden Hill, he was sure death has taken Yennefer too, leaving him borderline suicidal. We get none of that here, and the stakes are none. And this pair of looking moron obviously didn't leave our girl traumatized to the core. In the books, we don't find out what actually has happened during the siege till book 5 or 6. Good 
job lauren in this one episode alone you have missed so many character motivating actions sunk so many setups and confused the viewer with a completely unwarranted time jobs good fucking job you go girl way to go I connected with the story because of the three main characters, Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri. 